Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me. Um, I'm very honored to be here and have the chance to to uh, speak a little this afternoon. Um, when I started School of Journalism, I was actually very envious of my dad because he was a TV presenter in Denmark and um, he worked on TV in the late 70s and early 80s where TV really took off and started uh, becoming the big media and I was like, oh, I, I would have so loved to be in a generation that had defined a new media and I had no idea that I was actually in the middle of this amazing media boom um, with the internet. Um, and like it was just said in the introduction, um, I spent then 10 years trying to find my own place and, uh, and also the place for, for different media institutions that I work for in this what I call media revolution because it, it, in some senses it is a revolution. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some of the, um, the conclusions and some of the things I discovered along the way and I'm going to try to dissect a little bit what this whole digital media thing is about and what it means for the people that's, that would probably be, be most of us here today and um, what it means for the formats and the content and all those things. Um, but first let's just take a little bit of um, a brief look at what we actually mean by the, the, this digital media revolution. So there's some, oops, there's different things that, that actually is pushing this. One thing is all these new devices, so really cheap cameras, um, phones, all these things. Um, I mean the Leica M8 is maybe, uh, maybe an expensive camera, but it's ten times as cheap as the old Leica, or the, even the first Leicas. And what was interesting um, with actually Leica is that they came out with the first sort of handy camera that you could bring out into the field. And there were some photographers that embraced that back in the 40s, like Kappa and Katipa Song and so on. And that was actually an, uh, a good example of how a device can shape a new form of storytelling. And that's also what we're seeing now, just much more radical. Um, I mean, I remember I did some radio and I remember uh, buying my first dad recorder that was $10,000 and this big and then a few years later I could get a mini disc and it was $5,000 and much smaller and now I can get a recorder for $500 that weighs nothing so that's what happened within those t past 10 years just um, the second thing that's, that's happening is all these different tools online you have things like WordPress um, you have uh, the whole iLife package with Apple um, and you have these more serious pro tools uh, like um, Final Cut and so on and again it's become so amazingly cheap and easy to, um, to just install this stuff in your computer and produce it and um, when I did my first online documentary in 2000 um, we uh, of course we were, I was in school so I was using pirated software and all this stuff but if I had technically had to buy the software I would have spent like $20,000 and um, I was doing it in flash and we could like start a rendering process and wait three hours and then it would be ready. Now you know I can get everything for, I can buy the iLive package for 50 or maybe even less like $25 or something. Install it and produce pretty high quality content. So that's pretty amazing. Um, and then there's all these different services that are just starting to emerge now and, and um, that's going to change things. So, for instance, um, um, no, a Kickstarter. Kickstarter is the service where you can post a project and then other people can, uh, can contribute. When I started at Magnum uh, in 94, uh, we were one of the first things I was really discussing was, hey, let's start to do some, try to do some crowdsourced stuff. Let's say um, we have like a towel, he wants to uh, continue his work in Palestine. He's contributing with $5,000, but we need $5,000 more to be able to finalize the project. Let's ask people for that. But it was really hard for us because we, we had, didn't have the budget and the resources to build an infrastructure to do it. But now other people are actually building these infrastructures for us. So just this year, Larry Tao actually did what, what we were talking about uh, many years ago um, using uh, Kickstarter and he raised $10,000 in a couple of months and um, he's using that money now to do a project in Afghanistan. So there's some interesting things happening. I mean, it's still very early and Larry Tao can do it because he's supported by Magnum and a pretty big name in photography 
is harder for other people, but it's still an interesting tendency towards something new. Um, I mean, I also put Spotters up there, which is the startup in San Francisco, where um, you can either, as a journalist, say, hey, I'm covering this, I need support for this, or it can also go reverse. So people in a community can say, we have this story that we really want somebody to cover, do you want to cover it? And I think the reverse thing is actually also very interesting. Um, um, so there's these, uh, these things that are happening, which are actually creating three things, like a new type of storytellers, a new type of publications, and also a new, new type of stories. And uh, let's take a look at some of that. So first of all, the people, the storytellers. Um, so the old model used to be like that, you know. You had uh, journalists and they were producing something and <coughs> putting it out to the world. Um, and they pretty much had monopoly. Um, the new world is probably going to look more like this. We have, um, we have a pool of content that we all produce and access in different ways. Sometimes somebody else is producing the photos and somebody is producing the video and you find it and you mash it up and create something out of it. Um, and, um, and so basically like the foundations for everybody to do stories is there. You have iLife, you have the cheap cameras, you have all these things. Does that mean that everybody is going to be a good storyteller? Probably not. Um, so there's going to be different levels um, or different kinds of, of participants in this whole media space. Uh, I mean, that's just my theory, but, but that's what I'm think, thinking is going to happen. And I sort of divide them into these three categories called the um, Master Journeyman and Apprentice. It's a, a term I, I stole from World of Warcraft, and they stole it from, from the Samurais. I actually, I, uh, I recently did a presentation in Norway, and this German lady became really angry at me, because she was like, does that mean that Mag the Magnum folks are the masters, and then they're going to cut everybody else? And I was like, no, 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 it's just a term. Um, so, um, but what I mean is that um, there's some masters that are really amazing at their craft in one way or the other, Either they are amazing at putting a story together and doing the narrative, or they are, um, they are really uh, skillful full at the aesthetics, at composing photos, if it's photos, things like that. Or maybe they have some access that nobody else gets um, because they go crazy places that are dangerous or know people or something like that. Or sometimes it's a combination of all of them. But these kind of people do stuff that is um, so good and so hard to do that the rest of us want to pay them to do it. Then there's, um, then there's the journeyman who is... Um, or let me start with the apprentice. So the apprentice is actually all of us. We occasionally, all of us, can come by a plane that landed in the Hudson River in New York and take a little video and put it up on our blog or on our Facebook. So we're acting in the media space by doing some photography and video and other things but we're not really doing it because we're conscious about being journalists or whatever, uh, and we're not, we're not getting paid for it or anything. But in between the masters and the apprentices are these journeymen, who are sometimes maybe paid, sometimes hobbyists, but they're, they're sort of conscious about what they're doing. A good example is what's happening in the blocking space, where you, know, you have all these blockers, and some of them are actually contributing um, because they have a certain knowledge in a little niche, or um, or they, um, they they you know they can they can be very niche oriented because they're not um, subject to the same kind of business models uh, as big media institutions. And sometimes they they move sort of towards the master side and become masters or learn some new skills. Um, I mean, you see it in photography also with Flickr and all these things. That are, there are a certain percentage, I mean, there's maybe like 98% boring or bad photos out there, but there's 2% of this that are actually good enough, and 2% of the people there are becoming better and better, and actually, I don't know if it's exactly 2%, but some percentage uh, are actually becoming just as good as the ones that we used to call pros. Um, so to give some examples, I mean, I already talked about the apprentice thing. Um, I did I did some interviews to try to find some of these types, and one of the guys I spoke to. Let's so this is an example of a journeyman. He's uh, he's working on an ad agency in New York and just doing these um, these uh, pieces that he puts on his blog. But I think it's interesting to hear his sort of motivation. Do you have all these 
digital images that you do nothing with. So I guess nowadays people are starting to print books or print them up and put them on the wall or, or something like that, but you don't really have photo albums or slideshows like you used to. So I just started making these little films. Uh, I think it started with a trip to Puerto Rico or a cross-country trip uh, as a way to share them, which wasn't 200 boring images of friends getting them to search through. I mean, obviously, I didn't come up with the idea, but uh, I think uh, you see in iMovie, you get the, or iPhoto, you get these Ken Burns effect thing, which everybody was, you know, playing with when they first got their first Mac, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And then um, there's also the, uh, the New York Times did audio slideshows, which I really liked. And Magnum in Motion did really good slideshows, which I also saw and dug. I love the audio portion of that, but I don't see myself going out with a DAT recorder anytime soon. Um, so I well, let's just stop there. But I mean, the point is that he's looking at these pro things and starting to do stuff. And it might become master stuff, it might not, but it's a part of the whole media thing that you become more of a producer than just a consumer. Um, uh, it's actually one little curiosity about this interview was that I did it two days ago. Alan was in LA and I just recorded it via Skype. So that's another amazing thing I think that we're connected in this way. So I can be here, here in Copenhagen doing a pretty okay video interview. I mean it's not top quality but it's okay. Um, so let's look at one of the masters and what he says about this whole idea of everybody having a camera and so on. This is uh, Chris Anderson from uh, Magnum. My next guest is a member of today's Magnum. Christopher, Christopher Anderson, Anderson was born in British Columbia and grew up with a love of photography. In 1996, as a contract photographer for U.S. News and World Report, he began documenting social issues such as the effects of Russia's economic crisis and the situation of Afghan refugees in Pakistan. In 2005, he was invited to join Magnum, and Christopher Anderson joins me live in Studio Q. Hello. Hello. Your, your photographs still seem to have, uh, to look at them, they're quite beautiful. They're, there's, um, uh, they're stylized. That seems to be a, a priority for you. Uh, do you lament the fact that with the accessibility of, uh, of, of photo taking, the importance of beautiful photos may have been undermined? That we're, we'll accept images that aren't as professional, quote unquote, as they would have been and we would have accepted 20 years ago? Perhaps I could rephrase your question and say, do, do I think that I'm becoming obsolete because now that everyone has <laughs> now that everyone has a, a cell phone maybe to, to some degree yes but um, in, in other ways no I think my role is actually strengthened what I do as a photographer is not just make a nice picture or not just report an event but but some way in some way comment on this event uh, I'm very conscious of, of this idea of, of the responsibility that I have um, now uh, in terms of what I do as a photographer I don't believe in objectivity I am subjective. What I do is a subject, subjective thing. And I think it is actually, uh, it is my responsibility to have a point of view and to tell you my point of view. Um, is I think the res my, ultimately my responsibility is to try to do that in a way that is as honest uh, and as quote unquote truthful as I can do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is going to be my point of view. Uh, so I think Chris has a good point in saying, you know, as a professional or whatever we want to label it in the future, because I think those labels are also becoming a little bit obsolete. Um, it's a matter of maybe taking a position and having a voice with what you do. And that's what distinguishes you from the journeymen and the apprentices sometimes, that you're actually conscious about doing a story and having a mission in these things. Um, I think he's touching on something that, that's... Um, that's a direction and, and essential. So, so I think like one of the conclusions I have, like in the old world, um, there was this monopoly um, where some institutions were selling stuff to the rest of us. Um, but in the new landscape or world or whatever we want to call it, um, it's um, the ones that are actually going to do really well are the ones that take authorship of things. So they have their personal voice um, they work to get access to stories that are unusual and so on. Um, and the ones that are just producing factual in information and, and kind of distributing information are not 
um, at least going to be able to make a business because who's going to pay for that if the apprentices and the journeymen can do that just as well. Um, so the other thing I want to talk a little bit about is the publications, so the channels we actually use to get our stories out, because there's some pretty interesting changes there as well. I mean, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody anymore that you can actually really easily get your stories out there in the world. Um, you don't really need a TV station or a newspaper anymore. Um, the first time I really um, realized this was actually uh, just before I got employed with Magnum, I did this documentary together with a Danish photographer and another journalist, and we just did it in Denmark with our own little equipment. It was about um, Russian soldiers from the war in Chechnya, and sort of what they went through, and how you take a normal uh, young kid and transform them into somebody that's doing all these horrible things in, in Chechnya. Uh, so we went through Moscow over a couple of periods and interviewed these people and made photos. And we, we, uh, we just financed the whole thing ourselves and did it on our laptop. And then we put it online. And then a few publications picked it up and wrote about it. And we had pretty big traffic. And we ended up getting the um, online media award in, um, in the US, which was kind of funny as well, because it was like National Geographic and New York Times and I think and then one other, and then us, like these three Danish kids. So it showed me two things. First of all, like you can really get, get your voice out in the world without too much resource. And uh, you can actually also compete in another way. You don't have to be a big media. You can do something. You can beat the big media if you have a really good story and you have passion. Um, and right now, it's just exploding with all these really interesting channels, I think, where you can get your things out. Uh, so it's not online, per se, or it's not in the browser per se anymore. One of the things is this um, uh, uh, Flipboard. I'm going to show you a little video about what it is. And this is my Flipboard. The Flipboard is your personal magazine. It always has content you care about. And it knows what you care about because it knows who your friends are. This is all stuff my Twitter friends are looking to. Articles and images they think I should see. Your Flipboard connects to your social networks and gathers all the good stuff your friends are sharing. Any type of content your friends can share. Articles, images, photo albums, and video. They all come to you. And you can always handpick from Flipboard's own collections, from some of the most interesting sources on the web. I know I can always find something good in Flip Tech, for instance. And your Flipboard updates when your friends do so you're never at a loss for something to look at. And because your Flipboard is already connected to your social networks, you can share and reply from right there within the app. While your friends do the work of sharing the good stuff, your Flipboard collects it all in one incredible place. So you'll always have more good stuff waiting next time you open it. It's your magazine. It's your Flipboard. The stuff you care about all in one place. I don't know if you played around with it, but I mean, I've always been a big advocate for humans. I think, I mean, I've always advocated that, you know, you need a human to really curate and design and make these things amazing. And that's still the fact, but they actually automized sort of magazine layout to an extent I think is pretty impressive. I mean, they pull Facebook and Twitter and all these different RSS feeds from, from different media outlets and just put it into this layout and nine out of ten times it works really beautifully and there's quotes and so they, it's kind of an automated magazine that you can curate yourself um, another example is this pulse <laughs>
principle is the same. It aggregates all these different content and put it into a, to a nice uh, layout. If nothing else, I think there must be some jobs on, on creating these promotional videos for some of us. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but what's interesting is also that, that content is actually becoming open in this new way. I mean, every news outlet has some kind of access to that database. Um, so uh, so you, can, you can either pull an RSS feed or you can use these things called APIs, application programming interfaces, where you can actually dig into that database and p uh, build things that matches up the, the existing content. And it gives a whole other perspective of, of, on creating stories and curating stories. Um, and there's a whole like curation role in this, this game. An example of how you know, a, a traditional database is sort of using it is um, this project that, um, that a, a New York agency called Big Spaceship did for Getty. Um, they did a, a hook into Getty's database and then this web interface where you can actually go and um, put in different parameters. So it's called the Getty Mood Stream. Um, and you can say, you know, I want my content to be sad or happy and you can slide or calm and lively. Yes. <laughs> and all these things, and then you press a button, and it generates um, this story out of all the photos, and not probably just a selection of photos from Getty's database, and um, and videos and audio, um, and the result is quite funny. I think now I set it to be a little bit uh, sad and humorous, and uh, just in between cool and warm. And we'll see the result of this monkey. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another guy playing with a paper plane and stuff like that. Um, but um, I mean, this is a gadget, and it's it's fun. But actually, if you explore the the idea further, and and the more people start playing with these possibilities, I think some interesting stuff could come out of it. Um, you can save your streams, and you can share it with others, of course, and all these things. Um, so, um, so in the old world, oh, uh, I actually did it wrong. I can see because because the new world lets you customize the stream from many sources and tailor to all these different <coughs> devices, so you can watch it in your browser or you can watch it on your iPad or whatever. And the old world was just like broad news from a single source, um, and it was either in a news website. Um, or a, a newspaper or something like that, but you had to like get one, I mean of course you could buy 10 different newspapers, but it's still so much more narrow than it is now. Now it can be um, thousands of, of different sources from all over that you pull into like wherever you want to watch it. Um, and I think that's something worth noting if you're, if you're producing <coughs> media, producing storytelling nowadays. Um, so then there's the actual stories. Um, how does this change you know, the stories as such? Um, and um, I think one of the steps that we're, we really need to try to approach is this idea of interactivity. It's something I've been preaching forever, and I, I always had this idea that to really reach a unique form of storytelling online, we should try to explore interactivity. Um, because right now, a lot of the stuff we're doing is actually not new if you look at it from a storytelling point of view. It's new from a distribution point of view. So if you do a, a story with photos and audio and video and put it online, it's another way of distributing. But what we call multimedia has been done forever and it's like been done in presentations and slideshows and all these different ways. You just couldn't distribute it to the whole world. But I think the next interesting step is to try to create a new language. And what can the, the digital platform do that you can't do on TV or radio or, or print? Um, well, that's really closely linked to the interactive stuff. Um, and then again, what is interactivity then? It can be so many different things, but, but one of the interesting parts is, for instance, letting the user um, make some choices that take some different ways in the story. Um, it's also pretty hard because how do you break up a story and maintain a narrative. There's a balance. Sometimes, I mean, if you're an author or a narrator, you, you sometimes want to take control and, and decide what people should see when, because you have a point with it or because it makes the story more exciting or whatever. 
Um, so there's a balance, but at certain points maybe you can you can let a little bit of more control to the user. So one example I have is, is a YouTube-driven uh, project that um, this British NGO, NGO um, called um, uh, Drop the Weapons did, uh, which is this sort of quite simple video-based uh, thing where um, you follow a kid and the point is that you shouldn't be using weapons, especially knives and things like that. Um, so you have to make some choices. I'm not going to get away with it. You're right, mate, how's it going? Nice You're right. Man, yeah. They shank short. What do they think is going to happen? Go on, mate. It's going to go up tonight, big time. So you can choose here what you do, and then you continue, and there's different ways. Yeah, it takes, like, depending on your choices, between you know, a couple of minutes and like 20 minutes to go through the story, and you get all these different ways through the, through the story, depending on what choices you make. Um, but I think if you start to think about it in a documentary kind of frame, it can actually become quite interesting. Um, I've been giving it some thought, and of course it's, it's harder to make a documentary this way, because uh, it's real life, you can't just write a story. Um, but there is different approaches to it. I mean, one idea we had uh, at Magnum that we never did was to, um, to photograph different emergency rooms in New York. People that came in and so on, and then have, because there's doctors going around to, to a lot of different ones, we could follow the doctors and have them interlinked, and we would have some link between people and so on. I mean, you can hear that it's not really developed, but there's these different ideas that you could have, or you could, another idea we discussed was following clubbers that would intersect at different clubs at night and then go to other places and kind of have this whole network and then you could decide who you wanted to follow and so on. Um, so I think if you started to think about it, there could actually be some interesting ways of doing this. I mean, another, another thing that I worked with before was trying to do these islands or platforms or whatever you wanted to call it in between linear pieces. So you would have a linear piece of like three or four minutes and um, then you would stop and you would have the ability to dig deeper into certain topics um, or you could just choose to go on. So giving people the choice of depth is interesting, I think. Um, because, I mean, sometimes it's only, you always have these side stories when you edit a story. And the, one of the big challenges is, okay, what do you cut away? But, but, but sometimes you can leave in these side stories for the one little percentage of people that want to dig deeper into stuff. Um, again, you have, to, you have to not start to think that you can put everything in, I think, because, I mean, the web or the digital platform is not just a big bucket where you just don't edit at all, but you can edit in a different way. Um, another example is uh, this uh, purely, oh, so this is another example of, of interactivity in a way. It's a, uh, a Canadian uh, TV show that is about the, um, the uh, Allied invasion in Normandy, and they turned it into this online documentary sort of thing, or a mix between documentary and, and fiction. Um, and you can enter the side here. I don't know if I would ever really be ready for what we went through, but then you do may not go through what you think you're going to go through. So you, how could you be ready? You couldn't just train for one specific thing. We had to train for a lot of different applications.
within you, you have those fears that you're not going to make it. You can never do on TV or, or any other kind of medium, so it's, it's unique for this, this medium. Um, and I think we have to explore little simple things like that much more, um, where you have little levels and, and things. And so the hard part about doing stuff like this is that you move from it's, it's quite easy to, um, to edit a video, for instance, and put it on YouTube. I mean, it's hard to make it good, but it's easy just to do it. Um, but doing a, a thing like this requires a lot of technical expertise. You need to program Flash or HTML5 and all this stuff. And I think that's, that has been the big um, roadblock so far, to actually getting to the step where we start experimenting with this. And it's been a constant annoyance for me ever since I started. I taught myself a lot of Flash, but I don't want to be programming, I want to be doing content. Um, so that's actually partly what my new project is about, Story Planet, is about doing this tool, online tool, where you can upload all your things and you can put buttons on top of stuff and hotspots and you can load maps from Google and videos from YouTube and combine it all into these interactive packages without coding. But basically, because I think there's a need for this new type of, of, of a, um, tool of printing press almost. Yeah. If, you, if you do a print magazine, you have InDesign. If you do a presentation like this, you have PowerPoint or Keynote. If you do a video, you have Final Cut or iMovie. But there's no real tool other than Flash to do these things. So, um, so that's what we're trying to build. And I think if we succeed, um, or at least that's my hope, we're going to see a lot of really interesting experiments with, with this interactivity. So, so, so the old world, it, it was like, factual information, and I've said this thing about identity before, but I think a lot of the, the stuff is really without, from, the, from, from what you see at least on websites, is, um, is, is without this sort of personal voice or identity. And I think a project like the one I just showed you, is, um, it has a really strong sort of visual identity and stuff you can move around and so on. And um, so, so there's something about this engagement in the new world, like engaging people both on a, on a very um, sort of literal level where they have to click on stuff, but also on a, on a storytelling level by making a really complete package where visuals and photos and audio and all this stuff play together. Um, I think in the other example I showed you, I don't know if you noticed, but there was some really nice audio behind the whole thing which sets the scene and so on. And I think we can work much more with that. Um, so, sort of to complete, uh, con conclude a little bit, um, I think media has become this commodity. Uh, everybody can find photos and video and all this stuff. And in the future, it's going to be a much, much bigger commodity because you can access all these databases, like I showed you with Getty and so on. So everybody can be able to access and find good pieces to build uh, stories. Um, Tech is becoming this uh, commodity, so, so everybody can install something on their computer and have a recorder and have a, uh, a camera. Um, that's not the block anymore, and everybody can put it online. Um, so it's not the technology that sets us apart. What's going to be the value and what sets masters apart from apprentices and journeymen is uh, the storytelling. So it's your mission, what you want with the thing, it's how you put it together on a narrative level. Um, I think that's where the real value is, and that's what the ones of us that are gonna want to make a living from photographing or whatever we're doing has to focus on the storytelling part. Um, so one little... <coughs>
T'entends ça, chérie So with that one, I'm gonna leave some, some questions from you guys. Mr. Ibabet, I've got anybody with a question, yeah? We use the microphone because everything is being taped. Yeah. This uh, story, sorry, my name is Luc Kramer, a photographer. Um, this uh, story, planet.com, is it already exist and, and how to handle it as a photographer? Uh, can you tell something about it? Yeah, I mean, we spent the last couple of years um, sort of trying to work out this architecture because the big challenge is that um, we want it to be very flexible, so basically we want you to be able to have any crazy idea you want and just go and build it really easy. But it's really hard to make it easy if it has to be very flexible. It's like, so we had to figure out some principles and secondly we had to raise some money to do it. Um, it takes a lot of coding and so on. Uh, but we've been slowly developing, <coughs> developing some prototypes and testing it out and we're actually launching a, like a really early version in a month or so and we're about to close with an investor so I think within the next six months we're gonna we're gonna launch the real the real deal. I mean I actually put in here at the end I didn't want to make this you know a commercial thing but, but I put in <laughs> since you ask <laughs> I put in a few uh, screenshots just to give you an idea so um, so basically you could go in and you can choose some kind of template to work from or you can work from scratch. But we're having these templates just to make it easy for people um, to get started. And then you have this grid. And um, in the, the idea is that each of these tiles, let's see if I can. So this is a tile. Each of them is, a, is, a, is an element of your story. And you can build any kind of structure you want. So you can have like a linear story going here and then stop people and have side branches and people can go back. Or you can have you know different branches going out, like the YouTube movie I showed you, or um, you can link between different tiles. And you build your whole structure here. And you can build a very simple slideshow, or you can build something very complex. And then you can double click on each of these tiles, and you open this canvas. And on the canvas, you can build uh, almost anything you can imagine. It's sort of like a PowerPoint or uh, another canvas-based editor. So you can build really simple um, pages with text and photos, or it could just be a photo, or just a video clip. Um, and we built this app structure, and so apps are so such a buzzword now with the iPhone, but it's sort of the same idea that anybody can build a story app that you can use to drag. So let's say you want to do something very complicated, or something wild, I don't know, like a panorama photo. And we don't have. We, we're building some basic apps, um, but let's say we don't have it. You can actually either, if you know coding, you can do it yourself, or you can have somebody build a panorama app and add it to your story. So that's a way of making it very flexible. You don't have to build everything from scratch. You have a framework, but if there's certain crazy things you want to do, you can. It's still open to do it. And of course, it's our hope that there's going to be this whole community of people building apps to make a lot of different things possible. Um, one of the other things we are supporting is these, like for instance, the YouTube loader app. So you can drag in a, a, an app and put in a URL for YouTube and it loads a movie from YouTube. And you can do the same with Google Maps. Um, and we're working on all these ideas, for instance, donations. So if you want to take donations right inside your story window, you can do it through a donation app that integrates with PayPal or something like that. Wow. Um, and then we're also, we're not launching with this, but we're, we have this idea further down the road of doing an exchange where you can share photos and, and audio and video and all this stuff with each other. Um, because I think one of the challenges is that you're very seldom good at all the things. So you might be very good at photos, but then you need some awesome audio. So we want to open up for people to connect with each other and share media. And it could also be pro things. So, um, so Magnum, for instance, puts out a package of photos that you can buy cheaply and use. Um, it's something that I've been discussing for a long time with Magnum because I think Magnum's model 
where Newsweek or Time hire a photographer, they go to somewhere, they shoot a story, they come back, and then Newsweek puts it on the cover, like five photos, and maybe they have 200 pretty good photos, but they use five photos, and after a month, Newsweek doesn't care about it anymore. They just want it embargoed for that one, not even a month, like for a week or something. But after that, the photos are just in the archive. And I think it would be amazing if you could allow all these different uh, journeymen and apprentices to play with the photos. And it's not really taken out the other business model. So I hope we get to that point at some, some stage. Uh, and then, of course, you can publish it to, uh, to all these different... Uh, why does it want to stay there? It wanted me to say thank you, apparently. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you can publish it, and that's another thing we used a lot of time working on, enabling you to build one story and then publish it on all these different channels. So you can publish it for the browser, you can do it for your Facebook, you can put it on your WordPress site, you can put it on your tablet. Um, of course, there's some challenges if you build a story in a certain format for the iPad and you want to publish it for an iPhone, the challenge is the screen size. If you have uh, if you have text and so on, it becomes very small if you scale it down. But um, but other than that, in principle, you can you can uh, publish it to all these different or send it to all these different channels on our platform. And then of course, if you want to do an iPhone, you can you can do a you can duplicate your existing story and just adjust it a little bit, and that's easier than starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. yeah. So here's the thanks. <laughs> Okay, here's one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still need people testing this? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're gonna invite some people. Uh, you can sign up on our website actually, on our okay, okay. homepage, storyplanet.com. Um, so yeah, we're, we're gonna be inviting some. We, we are, in the beginning, it's only gonna be like a very few people that we know, but then we're gonna invite some more and more. So. So it's just a matter of signing up and then waiting for you to say okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Thanks. any more volunteers here? <laughs> <laughs> more questions, yeah? Hi, uh, can you tell something about the workshop you're going to do tomorrow? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. More commercials. <laughs> so yeah, I'm doing a workshop tomorrow, a mini workshop, and the idea is actually to um, to to take all the steps you do before you actually produce and start editing a story, so the whole planning thing, or not all the steps, but some of the steps if you want to do an interactive piece. So it's all about interactivity. So we're gonna, on paper, do these prototypes that you draw up where you, you come up with a concept like the YouTube example I showed you or something else um, of how people can navigate a story um, interactively and um, and then we're going to be wireframing, and so I'm going to be talking a lot more about how you design these interactive experiences. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit more about the different media types, so photos, video, audio, graphics, text, how all those things work, what the strengths and weaknesses are, because that's, uh, that's the other part of, of, uh, of creating a, a solid concept, is actually having a good idea and concept of how you want to use the different things. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to talk a little bit about it and then the participants are going to start drawing things and we'll discuss what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, a very obvious kind of maybe slightly silly question, but what's the income stream? How do you pay for what you do and pay yourselves in the process? Yeah. Well, I hope I can get some new shoes at some point because <laughs> uh, they're getting worn out. But um, well, our idea with Story Planet is that, um, that we're gonna um, we're gonna have some we're gonna charge for some of the more advanced stuff. So there's a free version that lures you in, and then once you're hooked, you want to do more advanced things, and then you have to pay. So let's say you wanna it could be certain apps like the donation app. Uh, you might want to pay, or you might have to pay a little bit to use that. Um, and um, and actually, with this exchange, we're gonna do like Apple is doing with their app store. So we take, if you're a developer and you develop a great app, we take, a, you can sell it on our exchange, and then we take a percentage, and you and they you get a percentage. Um, and we have a lot of different ideas that that could also be with stories. 
So one of, I mean, I don't know if we're going to do this, but we have this idea of maybe creating a network of outlets, and then as a storyteller, you have a chance of actually getting your story on a newspaper site or something, and uh, you get a little bit of money, and we get a little bit of money, and they get a little bit of money. So we, we split the advertising revenue. And then there's these services for really pro. So we're working with some big media outlets, and they pay more than the average person would pay for extra hosting and all this stuff. I mean, my personal hope, other than I really, really want this tool, and nobody did it, so I decided to do it myself. Um, other than that, it's like it could be great if, if this becomes something that I can make a living from so I can do some great projects that I can't make money from because that's always the dilemma I mean and that's how I've been doing for a long time it's like doing some commercial stuff making some money and then doing the real cool stuff on the side um, but um, yeah so that's that's the dream <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Nadeo. It was very interesting. Good luck with the project, and I'm looking forward to the rush tomorrow.